In this podcast, I am going to talk about people who feel uncomfortable with their biological sex and transgender ideology. These are two separate things, essentially, in my opinion, and it is the manufactured collision between them that is causing a lot of difficulty. It's a vast subject and I can only barely hit the ground in spots. It seems that issues connected with transgender ideology have leaked more and more in recent times into the public domain. Biological males are competing in women's sports, for example. Male prisoners are self-identifying as female and in some cases are being transferred to female prisons. Publicly funded education programs are teaching children from the age of eight and below that the biological presentation of their bodies has nothing to do with their actual gender and so on. People sometimes respond to conversations about transgender matters by saying, but it has so little effect on your life, why do you care? This is a variant, I think, of the who cares argument that is a common response to everything nowadays. It is incorrect for a start to say that transgender ideology has little effects on our lives, for it increasingly does. Though people experiencing gender dysphoria are small in number, although the numbers are increasing very rapidly, for reasons I will explore later on, still, somehow, the ideology that purports to form the theoretical basis for this experience is seeking to inveigle its way into common language and everyday life, public policy and legislation. This ideology denies outright empirical facts that have been established in the life sciences. It seeks to subvert reason, and in this aim, it is succeeding to a very surprising degree. This subversion of rational truth, especially in public life, forms a very dangerous and coercive precedent. If we are to arbitrarily accept and proclaim as true in the public square what is, to our senses and reason, observably false, then we become foolish and compromised. It will not be long under such circumstances before we must publicly announce that 2 plus 2 equals 5. That transgender ideology has already gotten such a foothold is the result of insidious political correctness and the proliferation of victim politics. But before I go any further, I would like to clarify my position on sex determination in the human being. Primary biological sex is determined at the point of conception. It is chromosomal. The female is XX and the male is XY. The Y chromosome tells the gonads to develop into testes rather than ovaries. If ovaries develop, the hormone produced, that is, oestrogen, causes the development of the uterus and a vagina, etc. If a Y chromosome is present, testosterone is produced and the child develops testicles and penis, etc. There are rare chromosomal anomalies that may produce intersex persons, but this is not the same as transgender persons. And there is zero biological basis for any ideology promoting the theory of a gender spectrum. The chromosomal account just given is the biological reality, the facts. I would also like to state at this point that unlike some critics of this subject, I have sympathy for people who may be finding themselves experiencing gender dysphoria. It must be an unbearable suffering to be so fundamentally alienated from one's natural form. And most of us have experienced at some time in our lives some vague dissatisfaction with aspects of our body. And so we may have some empathy regarding what it feels like to be so uncomfortable in one's form. Generally, however, what we do is we mature emotionally and accept things as they are. We develop the ability to live comfortably in our own bodies. And it is my contention that people suffering from the terrible affliction of gender dysphoria should be encouraged to develop coping mechanisms and wisdom sufficient to enable them to live in the bodies they have, rather than irreversibly and painfully try to change those bodies via chemicals and surgery. This opinion applies to the very limited number of people who genuinely feel discomfort because of potentially genetic reasons, and I am open to the possibility of that, or because of endocrine disruption. It is my belief, however, that there is a much larger number of people who have been socially conditioned and manipulated into feelings of gender dysphoria, and those people need to be made aware of that manipulation. So, 
Unlike those who balk at the very idea of transsexualism from the outset, I know there exists a community of people who don't fit into mainstream gender identity. And, having read around this issue, I find that there are very sensible people among this very community who advise serious caution before any gender affirmation activities are undertaken. Detransitioning is becoming a big thing now because hasty or emotional choices are being increasingly made and detransitioning is very painful and difficult. There hasn't been sufficient research done, for example, or at least published, into the lifetime effects on a biological female, for example, of having taken testosterone for several years and then stopping. And likewise, for biological males who revert from the use of oestrogen, the breasts that develop in those circumstances, for example, are permanent and will have to be surgically removed by mastectomy. Biological females who have used testosterone will be left with body and facial hair and a deeper voice permanently. But those who advise caution at the moment are regarded with deep suspicion among trans communities and detransitioners are especially regarded as traitors. The push that is happening now to transition people at ever younger ages sets up the greater likelihood of many more painful reversions to biological sex in the future. Wait and see should be the approach, especially where the young person has been heavily influenced by unknown peer groups, which is what the evidence is showing more and more. Wait and see follows the fundamental medical principle of first do no harm. But wait and see is not the approach being most commonly adopted, however, and there may be highly suspect motives at the root of the gender transitioning haste, I will examine some possibilities later on, such as money, cultic ideology, exploitation, early sexualization, and there may even be a bleak agenda that flirts with the edge of transhumanism and even eugenics. Transsexual identity has a long history. Though cross-dressing has existed in many cultures since antiquity, with one sex assuming roles such as cooking or craft working that are traditionally assigned or reserved for the opposite sex. It was not until very recent modernity that the idea of actually physically transitioning gender began to emerge. In 1951, there was Christine Jorgensen, an American, and they were the first person to have become widely known as having used both cross-sex hormones and then going for gender reassignment surgery to Europe. Previously, there had been some sex reassignment surgeries done in the 1930s, but generally these weren't all that successful. The word transsexual was not coined until 1949, and the word transgender itself did not come into usage until 1971. The first major textbook on the subject was published in 1966. It was written by a Dr. Harry Benjamin, an endocrinologist, and it was entitled The Transsexual Phenomenon. Harry Benjamin was impressed as a young doctor by a lecture given by Auguste Farrell about his book, The Sexual Question. Farrell was a psychiatrist and neuroanatomist. He studied ants, but perhaps most tellingly, he had a deep interest in eugenics. Later on, when he took refuge in the US, Dr. Harry Benjamin worked closely with Albert Kinsey, the famous sexologist. Kinsey introduced Benjamin to a child who wanted to be a girl in spite of being born a boy. The child's parents was very supportive of the child's efforts. Kinsey and Benjamin agreed that this was an unusual presentation and that it wasn't the same as the transvestites previously recognised. Benjamin treated the child with oestrogen. This was in the mid to late 1940s. That child later went to Europe for surgery. Harry Benjamin treated hundreds of children thereafter with cross-sex hormones. As a side note, while we're going into transsexual history, I have noticed that people sometimes point to the existence of two-spirit individuals in elder tribes as some kind of justification for the acceptance of transgender ideology. I don't believe personally that this is relevant. It is a romantic and sentimental view of the situation that may or may not have existed among Aboriginal peoples. First of all, an ambiguous gender identification in previous eras never included the possibility of radical physical intervention in the body. 
the two-spirit individual would have had to retain and accept the fully functioning sexual characteristics of their birth. The undermining theory of having been born in the wrong body simply could not have existed or even have been conceptualized. This is a big difference. The two-spirit person simply identified as a different type of their own biological sex, which was generally male, therefore as a feminine man. Also, two-spirit persons themselves have come out strongly to reject association with modern transgender ideology, as they hold that their institution is a sacred spiritual and ceremonial role. Most interestingly, perhaps, the Native American tribes who did not accept two-spirit people were the tribes such as the Apache and the Iroquois, who had societies that maintained the most equal status between the sexes. They are the ones who did not recognize two-spirit individuals. It was, in fact, the tribes who were most unequal that often had a separate categorization for feminine males. Cultures that accept two-spirit roles are not homogenous, nor equally accepting of gender variance. Personally, I have had some limited experience encountering members of the transsexual community in India known as Hijra. And though they are officially recognised, even in the Constitution, as a third gender, they lead very difficult and disadvantaged lives on the fringes of society. They are, in effect, outcasts, often resorting to prostitution to support themselves. The idea that there was some prelapsarian time when older traditional societies warmly embraced ambiguous gender is fragile at best, in my opinion. But having perused the history of ambiguous gender expression, one certainly cannot deny its existence. There is naught as queer as folks, and sexual and gender expression has long been multifarious and fluid. Problems began to arise, however, when transsexual identity met the broader, deconstructionist gender theories of academics like Judith Butler, or rather, Judith Butler in particular. Judith Butler is a gender theorist who has been teaching since the 1990s at the University of California in Berkeley. One of Judith Butler's primary objectives has been to destigmatize and depathologize transgender issues and to challenge all conventional notions of gender and to describe what she calls gender performativity. Basically, gender is a performance, according to Butler. In her own words, the actions appropriate for men and women have been transmitted to produce a social atmosphere that both maintains and legitimizes a seemingly natural gender binary. In other words, according to Butler, gender binary is a social construct. Her work draws on Freud, Lacan, Adorno, Derrida and Foucault. Gender has been socially constructed, she claims, via acts repeated in time. This is directly based on Derrida's theory of iterability. Thus, Judith Butler is an example of a highly influential postmodern theorist. Postmodernism is a deconstructionist philosophy that uses scepticism, irreverence and irony to challenge the very notions of the existence of any objective reality, truth, morality, a fundamental human nature or essence, indeed even reason, Postmodernism encourages moral and cultural relativism, whereby no idea or truth can be said to be any better than any other idea or truth. In fact, there are no truths, postmodernism claims. There are only interpretations. It is important to keep the existence of this philosophy in mind as we move deeper into the impact of transgender ideology on recent times especially in areas like language, education, public health policy, accepted science, and the treatment of children with various mental malaises and dysphorias. So back to Judith Butler for a moment. She aims to depathologize what she calls important acts of self-definition. So by this we can presume she includes radical mastectomies performed on young teenagers, pubertal blockers from the preteen years, and cross-sex hormones at 16 years old, vaginoplasties and phalloplasties constructed from the flesh of the forearm, 
chest binding and so on. In fact, Judith Butler has described people who object to radical surgical intervention as feminist tyrants. She says, I see no problem with women having a penis and men having a vagina. People can have whatever primary characteristics they have, whether given or acquired, and that does not necessarily imply what gender they will be or want to be. So we can see in this brief allusion to Judith Butler that her ideas are very influential in the sphere of transgender ideology. In 2013, gender identity disorder was reclassified in the United States Diagnostic Manual of Mental Disorders as gender dysphoria. And then in 2018, the WHO further disclassified dysphoria as sexual incongruence. There is some irony in the reclassification of transgender identities as normal sexual conditions because by removing the medical stigma, one may ultimately remove access to counselling hormones and surgery paid for by the state. After all, other conditions that are designated variations of normal don't attract state funding. And yet, thus far, access to state-funded gender affirmation procedures remains intact. This in itself is completely contradictory. The numbers said to be affected by transgender conditions have increased to between 0.3 to 0.7% of the population. These percentages have dramatically risen from earlier estimates of, for example, 0.015%. In some places, youth gender incongruence is being reported at 1% and even much more. There are a small number of studies which purport to show some genetic links to transgender identity. For example, it occurs more commonly in identical than in fraternal twins. And there is some evidence of a longer androgen receptor gene in trans females, which reduces its effectiveness for binding testosterone. Note, however, that even if genetic anomalies are discovered to be at the root of some gender dysphoria, that does not mean that society as a whole should jettison the biological science that correlates genital presentation and sex in the vast majority of cases. There are plenty of genetic conditions that affect small percentages of the population, But we don't educate children from a very young age to believe that a genetic condition such as sickle cell anemia may suddenly spring up in their body, such as we are apparently beginning to do with gender incongruence. Many other scientists deny outright that any biological link has been made. These scientists point towards emotional and psychological factors. For example, Ray Blanchard, an American-Canadian sexologist, has theorized two categories of transsexuals, the homosexual transsexual and the autogynophilic transsexual, who is a male erotically attracted to the idea of their own body as being female. Of course, his categorizations have attracted controversy, but there is something in them. Now that I have mentioned the homosexual transsexual, I will briefly address the split that is happening in LGBT circles as transgender ideology meets and struggles with its own incoherence. Some have suggested the explosion in numbers of young transgender identifying people is a way to erase homosexuality. For example, those parents who are so supportive of their transgender children may actually find that a straight trans child is more acceptable than a gay child. Also, perhaps boys that are feminine and would grow up to be gay are now being called girls and vice versa for tomboys. There is also a dispute within the queer community as lesbians who refuse to date trans women, that is, biological males, are called transphobes. The cotton ceiling is a term which was coined by the Canadian trans woman Drew DeVoe to describe the difficulty that gay and lesbian trans people face when it comes to dating. Lesbians, apparently, should not have any problem with women having penises, or girl dick as it is called, because a trans woman is a woman. This is the sticking point. Scientific reality is irrelevant because of one's feelings and wishes. This is ultimate deconstructionism. What could be more deconstructionist, after all, than the very idea that you could have been born in the wrong body? 
Postmodernists might work to convince you that your art is meaningless, your architecture, culture and music are worthless, your politics and poetry are culturally relative, but almost nothing could tear at the fabric of existence so well as the idea that one could be trapped inside their body by mistake. What a subtle seed of destruction to sow in the mind of impressionable youth. And so a destructive seed it does. I have read trans activists argue with a straight face that trans women are not men who became women. They are women who were coercively assigned male at birth by the patriarchy, which is obsessed by gender differences and heterosexual coding. The mental acrobatics are astonishing. On the other hand, there are plenty of trans men and trans women who know that they are not actually men and women. These people don't insist on ramming an incoherent ideology down people's throats, trying to convince them that gendered DNA, chromosomes and molecular biology are incorrect. These trans people, who genuinely do feel gender incongruence and who live with it as best they can, accepting the reality of their situation, are often viciously harassed by the more committed end of trans activism. Another aspect to note is the casual use by trans activists of people born with genetic intersex conditions as specimen samples in an attempt to prove that biological gender uncertainty exists. Intersex conditions occur at the rate of approximately 1.7% of the population. The use of intersex conditions as an example of transgender conditions is a ruse because intersex conditions are as a result of anomalous biological facts. Their condition is not based on feelings. Some intersex people are objecting strongly at this point at having been shoehorned into the trans activist arsenal and used as leverage to dismantle transphobia. Gender identity disorder is not an intersex condition. But anyway, back to reasons to possible causes for increasing transgender identity. An interesting idea is that androgyny may be a recurring feature in times of civilizational decline and collapse. Camille Paglia says that people who live in such times feel that they're very sophisticated, they're very cosmopolitan. But in truth, they are evidence of a civilization, she says, that no longer believes in itself. She sees it as ominous. I found in my study, she says, that history is cyclic and everywhere in the world you find this pattern in ancient times, that as a culture begins to decline, you have an efflorescence of transgender phenomena. This is a symptom of cultural collapse. There have also not been adequate studies done on the parents of children with gender dysphoria, although parental neglect and abuse and childhood adversity have been clearly and regularly linked to increased rates. Many of the parents appear to be narcissistic attention seekers. One example I will mention in passing is Desmond is Amazing, a young drag kid who has been basically pimped out by his unemployed parents since he was six years old. He was last seen, very recently, dancing on stage and receiving tips late at night in a gay bar called Club Woe. Desmond is 11 years old and is regularly lauded on the most popular morning TV shows in America for his fantastic and brave lifestyle. This, in my opinion, is a form of kite flying. Munchausen's by proxy in The Caregiver is another area that could do with investigation regarding childhood gender dysphoria. There is a suspicious amount of videotaping of very young children being published by attention-seeking parents with redemptive transgender stories to tell. A theory that is also not much pursued, as far as I can make out, but to which I would give some potential credence, concerns the ever-increasing presence of xenohormones in the environment. Xenohormones are artificially produced chemicals which mimic biological hormones, and they may come from many sources, such as plastics, solvents, medicines, etc. They are persistent in the environment, and they act as endocrine disruptors in many species. They lock into hormone receptor sites in the human body much more efficiently than do biological hormones. And we have been seeing evidence for quite some time of the feminization and genital disruption of amphibian and water-living species such as frogs and fish. Some researchers are looking at phthalates as having a particular role in endocrine disruption, 
Suzanne Bejerot, a professor at Oribro University, suggests that endocrine disruptors may be the cause of high fetal testosterone exposure, leading to an increased risk of gender dysphoria. And research in rats has shown that endocrine disruptors like PCBs profoundly impair the sexual differentiation of the female hypothalamus. The studies thus far are very limited, unfortunately. In fact, Studies in the whole area are limited overall because it is very difficult to get funding or approval for research in an area that is so politically and socially contentious. James Caspian at Bath Spa University, for example, who is a psychotherapist working with transgender people, recently had his proposal for research into detransitioning turned down because it would provoke criticism on social media. Lisa Littman, who is a physician scientist at Brown's University in the US, has recently run into problems with a paper on rapid onset gender dysphoria in teenagers. She had found evidence of social contagion among the population. The paper, which was published in PLOS 1 in August in 2018, and is one of the most cited research papers of the year, provoked a storm of criticism from trans activists. And as a result, the paper has been subject to post-publication investigation, which is highly unusual. Trans males who are detransitioning back to their female birth sex are vocal in their concern regarding the paucity of studies about the long-term effects of their own testosterone use. Girls who have stopped using tea, as the drug is commonly called in trans circles, after many years of use, are finding that they are being left with deep voices and increased body hair and facial hair, even several years after desisting. Studies about post-surgical outcomes are also in short supply. In some accounts I have seen by transitioned persons, they attest to the persistence or recurrence of gender dysphoria in spite of all the surgeries and hormones, which potentially relates, I believe, to the strong concomitance between gender dysphoria and other psychological malaises like anxiety, depression, body dysmorphia and autism. Comorbidity with other psychological conditions is at least in the 70% range, if not far more. The most long-term study of post-surgical outcome, which was done in Sweden, followed 324 sex reassigned people between 1973 and 2003, and it found that suicide, suicide attempt, and psychiatric ailment was much higher in the transition population. Patients were, in fact, 19 times more likely to commit suicide. This is post-reassignment of gender. Birmingham University did a review of 100 studies following up on post-operative transsexuals and concluded that none of the studies provided conclusive evidence that gender reassignment is beneficial in any way for patients. It found that most research was poorly designed, which skewed the results in favour of physically changing sex, and follow-up studies, they found, generally do not last long enough and they lose track of patients, or they use sample selections that are far too small to be effective. One aspect of transgender ideology that is very contradictory is the emphasis being put on gender expression. Dress and play, for example, in children has been indicative of some kind of gender incongruence. Some trans activists have described such cross-gender activity in infants as early signs that parents should be alert to. For example, a, ch a boy wishing to have long hair or a ponytail or opening baby grows to form skirts and so on or playing with Barbies across the gender trucks, etc. And this seems to be an approach that directly contradicts the idea of gender as a social construct, which is an idea that is fundamental to gender ideology. In fact, the overemphasis among transgendered people post-transition on gender stereotypes in clothing, activity, social presentation and so on is completely contradictory to the ideology at root level. Many trans women, for example, present in highly sexualized clothing, which may be supportive of Blanchard's autogynophilic theory, which was previously mentioned. The notion of gender as a social construct originated in feminist theory and is now being used, ironically, to undermine female spaces, identity and gender politics. 
The idea of social constructs goes back again to postmodernists. It is the bizarre idea that the infant is born a blank slate, which is observably untrue. In progressive societies where gender opportunities are equalised by social policies, gender differences tend to maximise. Everywhere there is empirical evidence that points to a biological basis for gender, and it is the attempt to subvert this reality that I find most concerning in the societal rush to be politically correct and accommodate gender incongruence. Part of subverting reality manifests in the use of chemicals. There are two types of chemicals used in in response to gender dysphoria, the pubertal blockers and the cross-sex hormones. Puberty blockers are used to hold back the development of secondary sexual characteristics. They slow the growth of sexual organs, for example, and the production of hormones. The primary risks of pubertal suppression include adverse effects on bone mineralization, compromised fertility, and unknown effects on brain development. There are other potential problems like high blood pressure, breast cancer, liver disease, and cardiovascular disease. Hundreds of children in the UK have been treated with puberty blockers, the youngest aged 10. In the US, the push is on to have children as young as 9 administered puberty blockers. There is also a large online trade in these chemicals and in the follow-up cross-sex hormones, so effects and amounts used can be very hard to track. Remember that the prefrontal cortex in the brain doesn't fully develop in human beings until they are in their mid-twenties. This is the area of the brain responsible for rational thought, planning and personality development. By contrast, teenagers often process information with the amygdala, which is a much more primitive part of the brain. Teenagers are thus being permitted to choose these chemical treatments at a time when their brain is very undeveloped. There is even increasing evidence that the hormones being used to treat gender dysphoria affect the brain itself. For example, changes have been found in cortical thickness. This is medical experimentation, if not eugenics. More than 85-90% to of children experiencing gender dysphoria will desist as adolescence continues, but rates of desistance decrease dramatically when pubertal blockers are introduced. Desistance is the most favourable outcome in terms of avoiding a lifelong chemical dependency and painful surgeries. But if hormones are pushed onto these children, they don't get a chance to experience a puberty which may even settle their dysphoria, nor do they experience any of the normal social sexual responses of the teenage years due to suppression of the libido by the blockers. And these responses themselves may have lessened the body dysmorphia. After puberty blockers, the teenager is prescribed cross-sex hormones, usually at about 16 years of age. These can be feminizing or masculinizing. Long-term effects beyond the obvious changes to sexual characteristics are not well known, but almost reliably include impotence and infertility. This is a given. We used to call that eugenics. There is also evidence of increased cardiovascular risk, osteoporosis, hormone-related cancers. As I've said before, breast growth and sterility are not reversible if a person desists from taking female hormones. Clitoral growth, facial hair growth, voice changes and male pattern baldness are also not reversible if a person desists from taking male hormones. Vaginal atrophy, itching, bacterial infections, these are all present with the use of cross-sex hormones. One of the unintended consequences of using cross-sex hormones has been the absence of enough penile tissue being available for subsequent vaginoplasty. That is to say that the child-sized penis that remains is sometimes insufficient for the construction of a neovagina. This is almost symbolic of transgender ideological contradictions. The construction of a penis in the case of trans men involves the mutilation of the forearm tissue or the side of the chest or the thigh. It is commonly claimed by trans activists that erection will be possible and even ejaculation, but this is a fabrication largely. The small tiny amount of skein's fluid which may in a minority of cases emerge from the constructed penis is not ejaculate. And these artificial penises require the installation of an internal pump mechanism to achieve erection. 
Young people should be clearly informed of all these realities. Neo-vaginas will require lifelong use of dilatory tools to maintain their shape, especially in the absence of intercourse. They don't produce lubrication and are much more susceptible to infection. And just in passing, I will mention another developing and quite bizarre feature in the use of cross-sex hormones, and that is the use of hormones to induce breastfeeding in a male parent, a biological male parent. At the end of 2018, a case was reported whereby, after a regime of domperidone, progesterone and breast pumping, a man was able to achieve sufficient breast milk volume to be the sole source of nourishment for their child for the first six weeks of that child's life. Domperidone is a hormone which is not approved for use in the US as it poses increased risk of cardiac arrest and there have not been studies done to ascertain safety risks for such a breastfed infant. One would have to feel contemptuous of the facilitation of such lactation fantasies at the expense of the well-being of newborn babies. What are the moral implications of forcing an infant to consume high doses of potentially dangerous hormones via lactation in order to appease a tiny minority of people who wish to push the biological barriers? Just because we can do something via science doesn't mean that we should do it. This is where the edge of transgender preoccupations begins to flirt with transhumanism. We are not properly debating future technological advances in the biological field. Gene editing, even the use of harvested fetal tissue, have begun to pass into ordinary usage without public consultation. Our technology begins to get away from us. Where is the limit we must place on our capacity? Where is the frank and open conversation about this? Apart from hormones, there have been a range of practices adopted among the transgender community which are very risky and unpleasant. One of them is chest binding among pubescent girls. This carries the risk of deformation of the rib cage and impedes breathing, causes back pain, chest pain, even fractures. Some physicians, such as Dr. Joanna Olson Kennedy, who is the assistant professor at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles and who is quite famous in this field, has been agitating for lower age limits for radical mastectomies. Girls as young as 13 are already having the procedure in the US. In 2018, just recently, Dr. Olson Kennedy was recorded at a conference saying that it was not a problem to remove breasts from children, even if this was later regretted, as in the future they could simply, quote, go and get them. This attitude illustrates perfectly the subtext of transgender ideology, that the human body is merely a machine that can be assembled and disassembled and reassembled at will, with parts removed, added and rearranged, according to the whim of surgeons. There is a tendency in recent times within transgender circles to move away from the idea of gender affirmative hormones and surgeries, probably because of the level of suffering such actions obviously involve, and maybe also because some people are finally recognising that this radical level of medical intrusion into the bodies of undeveloped young people amounts to abuse which will, in future years, lead to widespread legal actions. There is instead more and more emphasis now on relying on internal feelings with respect to gender without the need for any external adjustment. Now, one would have to welcome such a development because at least it may slow the number of mutilating surgeries. But then what is this movement going to do with the walking wounded it has left in its wake those left over from these times when the ideology is flailing around trying to achieve some level of coherence. Note, I will again make a distinction between people who may be feeling gender incongruence due to genetic or environmental disruptors and what I believe are the far greater number of people who have succumbed to dysphoria due to peer pressure, social media influence and contagion and even fashion. There has been an extraordinary sociological push towards increasing the number of people who are confused about their gender identity. We can see it all around us on TV shows, in online arenas, for example, even in education now. 
Jennifer Bielek, who has been studying trans activist agendas for quite some time, argues that the push for hormones and surgery was never a civil rights style grassroots movement at all, but rather is as a result of a radicalised, well financed and powerful lobby. Bielek has been looking at the money behind the trans lobby. There are exceedingly rich people investing in biomedical companies and simultaneously funding trans activist campaigns. Some of these include Jennifer Pritzker, a male who identifies as transgender, George Soros, Martin Rothblatt, a male who also identifies as transgender and transhumanist, and many other billionaires who are funding the transgender lobby through their own organisations, including corporations. In fact, between 2003 and 2013, funding for transgender issues increased more than eightfold. A lot of money is being thrown behind the trans lobby. Transgender markets, of course, would provide lucrative potential in the future for everyone from educators to counsellors, policymakers, surgeons, psychotherapists, advocates, trainers, and especially for a pharmaceutical industry. A lifelong dependency is created in an individual if dysmorphia is medicalised. The first gender clinic opened in the US in 2007 and now there are at least 30 such clinics. Biogenetics and wound transplant research are big areas for investment. Following the money seems to be a good piece of advice when it comes to tracking the explosion in transgender influence and ideology. Bielek has also clearly noticed the link to transhumanism in gender ideology, the idea that we can build it better, the hope for gene editing and external wounds. But in order to promote transhumanism, the human as it is now, a contrary complex collection of moral, psychic, spiritual, emotional and physical qualities, must be atomized, dehumanized essentially. The body must be reduced to its constitutive parts, which can be independent of any human essence and therefore manipulated at will. In order for such an ideology to sit well with people, there must be a profound alienation established within the human psyche. And believing that anyone could be born in the wrong body is a fairly good place to establish a base for such further empire building. Many people are noticing an alarming increase in the number of young people identifying as transgender. This increase among young people shows some signs of psychic or social contagion. In recent weeks, Tumblr announced that it will be cracking down on the inappropriate content on its site. Tumblr is one of the largest microblogging sites on the net and is very popular among young people. It had become a place where gender-confused and transitioning youth would share images and videos of their bodies, especially during transition, for inspiration. Lisa Littman, who I previously mentioned, has collated research which shows that many children experiencing gender discomfort will have frequented such social media sites, which are effectively transgender ghettos on the web. In passing... It is worth noting that these same ghettos on the internet often contain examples of extreme pornography, which has been suggested as one of the possible reasons why young girls are feeling so frightened by their developing pubescent bodies. I personally think that this savage and brutal pornography which proliferates in these dark places may indeed be a contributory factor to alienation from the natural form. So children expressing dysphoria will often have had direct contact with supportive trans communities online, such as on Tumblr, and will have numerous friends in their social peer group who also expressed similar discomfort with their bodies. The often sudden onset of the dysphoria has been given the name Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria or or OGD, even though trans activists object very strenuously to this term. These children have manifested increased use of social media before claiming dysphoria and they are predominantly female. 
These children display cult-like symptoms such as distrust of family and friends who hesitate to accept their new identity and isolation from previous life activities and associations and only trusting information if it has been given to them by their online peers. Rachel McKinnon, who I will return to again as they promote themselves as an expert in the field of trans women in female sports, advised children in a recent video to dump their unsupportive families and to find their true glitter family online. This talk would be typical of the online trans cult. There tends also to be clustered outbreaks of these ROGD phenomenon. All of this Pied Piper of Hamlin-style behaviour corresponds to other psychic contagions that have happened before, such as the multiple personality disorder contagion of earlier years or the recovered memories of childhood sex abuse that was very popular in the 1990s. These are all social contagions which have hysterical patterns of behaviour. So there is growing evidence of the role of psychosocial factors in shaping the onset of the desire to transition. Numbers attending childhood gender clinics in the UK have increased by 4,000% in the last 10 years. A committee has even been established by the UK government to investigate the reason for this massive increase. But back for a moment now to the outcome from the Tumblr attempt to crack down on inappropriate content. Owing to an outcry from their large trans fan base, Tumblr decided that while the naked form will still no longer be permitted on Tumblr, exceptions will be made in the case of medical context. Thus, people displaying mastectomies pre and after and phalloplasty and neovaginas will be permitted to be nude. Transition videos and images are acceptable but no ordinary nudity that is not the result of hormones or surgery will be available for young people to view on Tumblr in the future. This is quite disturbing. An impressionable child who uses Tumblr might rarely see a naked image of a non-transgendered human being if this comes to pass. While the internet is a place that has been busy cultivating gender dysphoria, of late, one finds more and more the difficult stories of people trying to detransition, though these people are often being cast out of their communities as turncoats. Transgender ideology is also radically influencing the shape of legislation. For example, there has been a spirited debate over the last year regarding changes that will be made to legislation permitting gender self-identification in the UK. The Irish Gender Self-Identification Legislation in the form of the 2015 Gender Recognition Act is among the earliest examples of such legislation in the world. The Act provides a process enabling trans people to achieve full legal recognition of their preferred gender and allows for the acquisition of a new birth certificate that reflects this change. The Gender Recognition Act allows all individuals over the age of 18 to simply self-declare their own gender identity. Children between the ages of 16 and 18 may also have their gender changed, but they must do so by court order. Passports will also be amended to reflect the changes. This gender self-identification has and will have potential implications in so many areas. For example, in the collection and study of medical data related to gender, it may be compromised. And there are also implications regarding issues like blood donation, where gender is relevant. There are implications regarding crime statistics, for example. Women have heretofore not featured particularly highly in rape and incense statistics, although they do feature. But this will change as more rapists self-identify as women. Also, sex-protected spaces are becoming much more vulnerable to infiltration by people who have simply self-identified as female. Among such spaces are women's refuges and women's prisons. Already there have been plenty of instances where violence has been committed against female prisoners by biological males identifying as female and being transferred to a female prison. And by this I mean rapes and sexual assault. There have also been rapes and sexual assaults in women's shelters where females have been forced to share rooms and showers with biological males. A 
Of course, it would not pose as many difficulties for trans men to invade male spaces, which is why I'm speaking about female spaces more, because due to size and strength differences, biological females identifying as male are not going to be as much of a danger. Although in some cases they certainly might be, because there's a culture of steroid use and bodybuilding among some trans men. But it's just that I have yet to hear of incidences where there have been significant problems. Trans activists, of course, dismiss such events as isolated instances, but this is simply not the case. These incidences are becoming much more common and can only ever increase in number, with gender self-identification being made so easy. The contradictory transgender ideology that has been fully embraced at legislative level by public bodies due to political correctness makes it all the more difficult to ever roll back on these provisions. And this has implications for girl guides organisations, for single-sex dormitory rooms in hostels, for single-sex hospital wards, for sleeping compartments on trains reserved for one sex, for single-sex boarding schools, female-only shortlists, Women of the Year awards, even beauty pageants. But all of these manifestations of the contradictions at the heart of transgender ideology pale in comparison to the very public unravelling of female sports. Biological males can now compete freely and by permission from the highest sporting regulatory authorities in female sports. Prisons and shelters and girl guide tents are largely invisible, but in the very public sporting arena, when a biological male says, I am a woman and you must accept that this is so, the cognitive dissonance is so much more easy to apprehend. It is easy in this circumstance to see that the transgender ideology is affecting societal activity to such an extent that it appears to be a form of social engineering. Concepts that have no foundation in empirical science are being astroturfed onto entire populations right in front of their eyes now. Rachel McKinnon, who I previously mentioned, is an assistant professor at the College of Charleston Department of Philosophy and has been winning all around them in female cycling, though they are a biological male, declares that she is a woman who is genetically blessed with the ability to increase muscle mass. McKinnon is part of an increasing cohort of sports trans activists who are agitating to have not only genitals be irrelevant, but even testosterone levels are to be considered irrelevant. Why should trans athletes harm their bodies with hormone suppressants, is what McKinnon argues. McKinnon says, Focusing on performance and vantage is largely irrelevant because this is a rights issue. We shouldn't be worried about trans people taking over the Olympics. We should instead be worried about their human rights. It is in this arena of female sports that I believe transgender ideology just may meet its waterloo. Meanwhile, public language, discourse and education is being strongly affected, turned on its head even. Global corporations such as Twitter have been accused of shutting down debate by defining misgendering or dead naming as hate speech. The Irish Parliament recently witnessed several representatives wondering aloud if the term pregnant woman in the forthcoming abortion legislation might not be considered discriminatory. It was suggested on the public record to replace the words pregnant woman with the term pregnant person as an act of tribute towards the great work done by the trans community in campaigning for abortion. Other new words have casually entered the lexicon of common language. TERF means trans-exclusionary radical feminist. It is a slur generally cast upon second-generation feminists who object to the erasure of women that they see happening as a result of the spread of transgender ideology. Assigned male or female at birth, AMAB or AFAB, is coming into use ever more often nowadays, even though it specifically embraces in words the theory that gender is a coercive activity, This is pure ideology. And the absolutely repugnant suffix cis is also entering into quite common usage, even though biological males and females often object vehemently to it. The word cis is shoehorned in as a companion to trans, and it seeks to qualify biological sex. 
Cis attempts to be a qualitative definer of the simple nouns man and woman or male and female, thus opening up the possibility of there being different categories of men and women when there are not such different categories. There may certainly be descriptors such as tall or fat or black or disabled, etc., but there are not different categories, that is, unless logic and reason are completely discarded. Chest feeding is used as the phrase breastfeeding is considered transphobic. Mothers, you see, are not the only ones who can lactate and feed their infants. Women are being referred to as menstruators, especially by woke dealers of menstrual products, because it is not only women who bleed. In fact, the use of the phrase feminine care in relation to such products has been challenged as discriminatory. The Guardian newspaper referred in a 2018 Twitter poll to the experiences of menstruators in regard to period pain. There have been some attempts to replace the word vagina with the phrase front hole, though this is so far gaining not too much traction, except in the most dedicated of trans ally spaces. Girl dick, the female penis, is gaining some notoriety and will perhaps migrate into more common usage. Miranda Yardley, who is a transsexual, wrote in December 2018 that, as anyone who has ever participated in social media knows, any criticism of transgender ideology, which we all of us have the right to accept, critique and reject, any deviation from the brain-sucking mantra of trans women are women, is met with reports to our employers, threats of physical violence and threats of rape and death. The evolution of language must accommodate the ideology that men can be pregnant, that men may have vaginas, and that women can have penises. The National Health Service in the UK got on board the new language train recently by not only calling women people who have a cervix, but by going one step further and inviting people who identify as women for screening of their imaginary cervixes as if the health systems worldwide were not already overburdened with actual health issues, now they will accommodate fantasies too. Compelled speech is a fact under some legislation, but more commonly under institutional policy and guideline requirements. Jobs and promotions can be lost if people use incorrect pronouns. We are being asked to reconstruct public speech to accommodate the discomfort of a tiny percentage of people that until very recently were classified as suffering from a mental disorder and we are rolling over like trained dogs to do so. Why is this? Transgender ideology is also spreading through education. It migrated first from the academy, as many novel ideas are wont to do, but now it has insinuated itself all the way down to the most junior classrooms in primary schools in many countries. For example, a document called Supporting Transgender Young People was part funded by the Scottish Government and introduced very recently into the Scottish education system. It says that pupils should compete in sports in the gender they feel most comfortable with and parents should not be told if a child wants to change gender or share rooms with the opposite sex on school trips unless the child gives their consent. Instances of discomfort and even assault being caused in bathrooms, sports changing areas and other single sex areas in school are multiplying. Some are arguing that the introduction of gender identity politics to children at a young age is confusing them. But of course it is. The Dorothy Springer School in Brighton, a fashionable liberal school, has over 40 students who identify as transgender in 2018 and a further 36 who identify as gender fluid. The National Lottery in the UK recently awarded a grant of £500,000 to Mermaids, a trans activist organisation who has said they will use the money to create 45 groups nationwide. One of Mermaids' stated aims is to provide trans guidance and diversity training in schools. Susie Green is the chair of Mermaids in the UK. 
Susie Green brought her son to Thailand when he was 16 years old for surgery to have their genitals removed in order to affirm their identity as a girl. At 16. Transgender ideology is also linked to the destruction of the primacy of the family structure. What better way to make youth dependent on the teat of the state than to estrange them from their families and to offer them their so-called rights, especially if their uncooperative parents are refusing them? As mentioned previously, children are being permitted to socially transition in schools without parents being told. And the Transgender Equality Network in Ireland is agitating at the moment to give children under 16 the right to change gender without parental consent. Under 16. The Infants Act in Canada has been very recently used. To permit a child at the BC Children's Hospital in Canada to be given testosterone injections against her father's wishes. Children may be removed from the custody of their families in some places if the family does not support their child's gender transition. For example, Bill 89 in Ontario allows the family only to direct the child or young person's education and upbringing in accordance with the child's creed, community identity and cultural identity. The child is being put centre stage in directing their own upbringing, thus eviscerating the historic human culture of elders guiding the young. California's Fair Education Act of 2017 seeks to normalise radical gender identity ideology among small school children. It makes it law for there to be a diverse portrayal of homosexual and transgender persons in curriculum material. The use of gender-neutral words is encouraged, for example, using siblings instead of brother or sister. In Victoria, in Australia, the councils are advocating for the banning of gendered words such as boy or girl in children's school books. Children are the vanguard, the front line in the transgender movement's intention to inculcate an irrational ideology into future human society. Before I sign off, I would like to mention a potential link that I notice in transgender ideology towards progressive paedophilia acceptance. Others are also noticing this, and even some trans activists are being moved to publicly denounce any attempt to piggyback the cause of minor attracted persons, or MAPs, as is the acronym, onto the trans movement. MAPs and no MAPs, as non-offending minor attracted persons call themselves, are nonetheless emerging in the LGBT arena, claiming that theirs is a valid orientation, as biologically inherent as transgender identity claims itself to be. Thus, the ideology of the transgender movement is being used in novel ways. It is worth remembering, by the way, that NAMBLA, or the Men Boy Love Association played an integral role in the early gay rights movement, and now it seems that they are back for a second bite at the cherry. Regardless of whether this angle will gain any traction or not, there is undeniably an enculturation of narcissism and eroticism among young people in extreme trans ideology. There are examples of young drag kids being lauded for their stunning and brave lives, such as Desmond is Amazing and Lactasia. These children are mimicking sexualized adults, and they are very much part of the trans community, and they are also being lauded on mainstream daytime television shows all over the world. In fact, the very identity that any children from infancy would be hyper aware of their gender identity at least hints towards extremely early sexualization. A child should be a child, not a gender. No one has any business to interfere with childhood or to cause children to feel in any way uncertain about their biological sex. Also, if the public is coerced into accepting, which it seems to be, that gender incongruence is biologically inherent, then what else can the public be persuaded to accept as inherent and thus unavoidable? If ideology can make biology irrelevant so that the basic definitions of man and woman blur, it ultimately makes it easier to blur the definition between adult and child. Perhaps the most important word I will use in this presentation is desensitization. Desensitization is a vital weapon in the battle for our moral instincts, 
A whole society can be groomed via desensitization, not just a vulnerable individual. Little by little, slowly, slowly, people's reasoned and instinctive morality can be eroded. The extreme left in general, who would be the biggest supporters of transgender ideology, have a historic seedy underbelly that hides in certain quarters an inclination to normalise paedophilia. As one commentator said recently, Marxist queer theory claims that every element of bourgeois morality must be systematically swept away in order to finally destroy capitalist society. After transgender comes no gender. This is the arc of the narrative. After there is no gender, then anything goes. Of course, the opinions and facts are presented here according to my own prejudices, and another person might make a very different presentation of the findings. My examination of how gender incongruence is being handled presently gives me cause for serious and continuous disquiet, mainly because trans activists seek to extend biological denialism into all of our lives, and this has sinister implications. Also, because there is an undeniable and suspicious undercurrent regarding the early sexualization of young children, this is something we need to be aware of. And also, something that is not so prevalent on most people's radar, because there is an undeniable link being established with transhumanist aspirations. But fundamentally, I also object to the huge suffering being inflicted upon swathes of people, young people especially, in the pursuit of this deconstructionist philosophy. I believe that gender incongruence, if it exists, could be more comfortably accommodated in the lives of those experiencing it if there is a mature acceptance of the naturally occurring spectrum of human expression. It requires neither to be made into a fetish nor a pathology, nor does it require the barbarity of present-day surgical alterations, which can only ever result in a facsimile of the desired gender, a simulacrum of the form of the other. It would be better if, from childhood, those who found themselves uncomfortable in any way, physically or emotionally, could be taught to accept the naturally begotten state of being human. But then, those with deep pockets, corrupt appetites and a hunger for power would never benefit from that, would they?' 